Let me begin by uh, acknowledging the land on which the University of Toronto operates uh, for thousands of years. It's been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Uh, thank you all for coming to uh, watch the Grand Moot tonight. This is one of the highlights, uh, perhaps even the highlight, of our academic year, and it's wonderful to see you here tonight. Um, we're honored to have a panel that will comprise the Honorable Justice Russell Brown of the Supreme Court of Canada, the Honorable Justice Robert Sharp of the Court of Appeal for Ontario, and the Honorable Justice Elizabeth Stewart from the Aper Ontario Superior Court of Justice. Uh, we are also delighted to report that for the first time, uh, all of the mooters in the Grand Moot are women. Um, they are, for the, appellant, for the appellants, Jessica Cross, uh, Madeline Lysis, and for the respondent, Ashley Boron and Catherine Fan. The mooting problem, about which you will hear more in a second, is about assisted reproduction, asking first whether Section 6.1 of the Assisted Human Reproduction Act, which prohibits commercial surrogacy, violates the rights of intended parents under Section 7 of the Charter. Second, whether Section 6.1 of the Assisted Human Reproduction Act violates the rights of LGBTQ couples or prospective surrogates under Section 15 of the Charter. Finally, there's the question of whether Section 6.1 of the Assisted Human Reproduction Act can be saved under Section 1 of the Charter if it infringes either Section 7 or Section 15. It takes a great deal of work to put together a grand moot, uh, and I want to uh, say a few thank yous. First of all, I want to thank the co-chief justices, uh, Steph Lewis and Carrie Sun, who have been involved in every step of planning and organizing, and most importantly, writing the problem. Um, Carrie and Stephanie uh, received, and the mooters, received support and help from many members of our faculty and other uh, members of the University of Toronto Faculty of Law community. I want to mention a number, uh, a number of people who helped out, and they include the Honorable Justice Gloria Epstein, the Honorable Justice Hal Allison Harvison Young, uh, Professors Yasmin Dawood, uh, Trudeau Lemons, Cheryl Milne, Martha Schaefer, Hamish Stewart, Carol Rogerson, Jim Phillips, Lorraine Weinrib, and from McCarthy's, Megan Bridges, Daryl Cruz, K Jeff Hall, Jordan Katz, Patricia Lewis, and Christine Wadsworth. As Catherine Fan was mentioning uh, earlier, it might be faster to, uh, thank the, to mention the people that we're not thanking tonight. Uh, but thanks for such an incredible uh, show of support for our grand mooters. Uh, and uh, just one final note about McCarthy's. They are, uh, again this year, as they have for many years, the sponsors of this event. Our thanks to our wonderful alumnus, uh, Paul Morrison, and the entire McCarthy's team, who not only lend their financial support, but also uh, support the Mooters intellectually uh, and with the uh, substance of the problem. Thank you very much for your ongoing support. With that, I will turn it over to the Co-Chief Justices, uh, Carrie Sun and Steph Lewis. Thank you very much. I would just like to begin by echoing uh, Dean Iacobucci's thanks to our generous sponsor, uh, McCarthy Tatro. And uh, now while I'm sure that everyone here has already read and marked up the official problem and the facta in true U of T law style, um, I will give a brief overview of the problem just to refresh everyone's memory on that. <laughs> this appeal, as you heard from Dean Iacobucci, involves a charter challenge to section 6 sub 1 of the Assisted Human Reproduction Act, which prohibits commercial surrogacy and that is the payment of consideration in exchange for carrying another individual's child to term. This challenge was brought by Mr. Spencer Lewiston and Mr. Kevin Soleil, who are a couple residing in Trudeau, which is a city in the province of Falconer in the country of Flavel. Falconer, Falconer and Flavel are a fictional province and a fictional country, and they are functionally equivalent to Ontario and Canada, respectively, in terms of their common law histories, systems of government, and legislation. Mr. Lewiston and Mr. Soleil are both partners and heads of their practice groups at a prominent law firm in Trudeau. And after they each made partner, they decided to start investigating their options for having a child. While they considered adoption, it was important to them to have a child who is genetically related. In 2010, they decided to use gametes donated by Mr. Soleil and by Mr. Lewiston's sister, Julianne. Julianne also agreed to act as the couple's surrogate and she underwent several rounds of in vitro fertilization, 
However, implantation was unsuccessful in each cycle. Unfortunately, no other family members or friends were willing to act as the couple's surrogate. So in 2013, they decided to start advertising for one. In 2014, Mrs. Petra Parker responded to the couple's advertisements. Mrs. Parker is a married mother of two who has already completed her own family. She explained to the couple that her family has many queer friends and the couple's story resonated with her because she has witnessed firsthand how difficult it can be for some members of the LGBTQ community to have children. However, Mrs. Parker asked the couple whether they would be willing to pay her for her services. She has carried two of her own children and she knows how much work is involved in pregnancy and in giving birth. Mr. Lewiston and Mr. Soleil offered to reimburse Mrs. Parker for her pregnancy-related expenses, which was allowed to pr pursuant to the Act's regulations. However, they explained to her that payment in exchange for the actual surrogacy services is illegal. They continued their advertising for another year, but were unable to find another surrogate. Then they decided to launch this charter challenge. Mr. Lewiston and Mr. Soleil alleged that Section 6 sub 1 of the AHRA violates their rights under Section 7 and Section 15, as well as the Section 15 rights of potential surrogates of under the Charter. Mr. Lewiston and Mr. Soleil and the Attorney General of Clavel tendered expert evidence supporting their respective positions, and Mr. Lewiston and Mr. Soleil each testified to their own experience. At trial, all of this evidence was accepted by the trial judge and it is not the subject of dispute, not subject to dispute in this appeal. The trial judge held that section 6 sub 1 of the AH AHRA did not infringe either section 7 or section 15 of the charter, but reasoned in the alternative that it would be saved under section 1. On appeal, the majority of the Court of Appeal for Falconer upheld the trial judge's decision. However, in the Court of Appeal, Justice Noonan wrote a lengthy dissent explaining why, in her view, Section 6 sub 1 violated both Section 7 and Section 15 and could not be saved under Section 1. The Supreme Court of Falconer has granted leave to appeal and will hear, hear the party's submissions today. I would ask you to please switch your cell phones to silent at this time as I now cede the floor to four women who, with whom I have had the pleasure of working these past few months. Ashley Bowron, Catherine Fan, Madeline Lysis, and Jessica Cross will now explore the policy, ethics, and most importantly, of course, what you are all here for today, the legality of section 6 sub 1, the criminal prohibition on commercial surrogacy. Good afternoon. Calling the matter of Spencer Lewiston and Kevin Soleil and the Attorney General of Flavel. Uh, counsel for the appellants, uh, Jessica Cross and Madeline Lysis. Counsel for the respondents, Ashley Bowron and Catherine Fan. Counsel? Good evening, Justices. My name is Madeline Lysis, and with my co-counsel, Jessica Cross, we are here today for the appellants, Mr. Soleil and Mr. Lewiston. Our friends, Ashley Bowron and Catherine Fan, are here today for the respondents, the Attorney General. Mr. Soleil and Mr. Lewiston have been trying to have a child for almost a decade. Mrs. Parker is a competent and autonomous married mother of two who for principled and compassionate reasons wishes to enter 
a compensated surrogacy agreement with the appellants. She also wishes to be compensated for her work. The only thing stopping the appellants and Mrs. Parker from entering into this mutually beneficial arrangement is section six sub one of the Assisted Human Reproduction Act. The constitutional question before this court today is whether Parliament has overstepped its bounds in enacting a total criminal prohibition on any form of compensation for surrogacy services. The answer to this question is yes. And the answer is yes for two reasons. First, section six sub one violates Mr. Lewiston and Mr. Soleil's section seven rights. And second, section six sub one violates the section 15 rights of both gay male couples who seek to be intended parents and surrogates. I will present our first submission concerning section seven and Ms. Cross will present our section 15 and section one submissions. The beginning of our submissions can be found at paragraph 18 of the appellant's factum. In a nutshell, our section seven argument consists of four principles. Section seven is engaged through imprisonment and because having a child is a fundamental personal choice. The total criminal prohibition on, co on compensated surrogacy is a state imposed barrier that restricts the appellant's ability to exercise this choice, which also causes psychological harm. This restriction bears no relation to the law's proper objective of preventing the financial exploitation of vulnerable women, and insofar as it criminalizes non-exploitative arrangements with women who are not vulnerable, this law is arbitrary and overbroad and infringes Section 7. There is no contest that liberty is engaged through the possibility of imprisonment, but the scope of this liberty engagement goes even farther as it is a serious state intrusion into the appellant's fundamental personal choice to have a child. These fundamental personal choices are important decisions that intimately affect an individual's private life. Justice Wilson and Morgenthaler found that a woman's decision to terminate her pregnancy was such a choice. Would a state imposed restriction on adoption also violate section seven? It may justices, but in this case, we're concerned specifically with the ability for the, in, for the appellants to pursue their choice to have a genetic child and to have a biological child, which is only available to them as a gay male couple through surrogacy. The Supreme Court has also held that Section 7 protects a protected sphere of parental decision making and that status as a parent is so fundamental to one's identity as to engage Section 7 also recognized as a fundamental choice enjoying the protection of Section 7's liberty interest has been in Gobal and Langille, the right to establish one's home where one wants. Choosing where to establish one's home was found to be an inherently personal choice that, quote, goes to the very heart of personal or individual autonomy. Given that choices have been recognized such as where to establish one's home, and given that status as a parent and has been recognized as a section seven choice, we believe that it is open to this court and that this court should recognize. Is this the same as status? As status as a parent, those cases all involve people who have children, don't they? This is a case where they want to have children. There are various ways they can have children, adoption, not surrogacy that's not paid. Uh, how, does, how does that rise to the level of, of a fundamental We're not saying, Justice Sharp, that it is the same, the exact same right as the parental status recognized in VR and GJ, uh, two separate Supreme Court cases. But we're saying that given the recognition in those cases, it is open to this court to extend the recognition as well to the choice to have a genetic child. And the second element of your question, which I believe asks, isn't this perhaps as our friend suggests, simply a preferred means of having a child or one out of multiple options. We submit that this is not an accurate characterization of this case or of the state of surrogacy in Flavel. The very nature of a fundamental personal choice is that it is not open to the state to dictate that choice. 
the state is not entitled to tell the appellants how they should create their family or how they should have a child. Their decision to have a biological child and to pursue that option through surrogacy is intimately affects their personal life and the choice to have a biological child goes to one's dignity and the ability to decide how to live one's life, which directly engages the Section 7 interest. I, I guess I come back to my question then, why, why uh, wouldn't we have the same concern about restrictions on adoption? Again, Justice, uh, it is indeed perhaps the case that we would have the same concern about restrictions on adoption. And if the state chose to, for example, enact a prohibition restricting uh, access to adoption for certain kinds of couples, that may very well be a Section 7 restriction. But in this case, when we look at the prohibition and its restriction on the access to surrogacy services, where we have evidence on the record from Dr. Amit Singh saying that demand for surrogacy in Flavel is high, and the number of women who are willing to perform the service for free is unsurprisingly low. We see that Section 6 sub 1 is itself imposing a restriction and is a state-imposed barrier on the appellant's ability to access this choice. The, the argument and the question, why not adopt, has multiple problems. First, it fails to acknowledge the difficulties, expenses, and risks involved with adoption, especially for LGBTQ parents. But even putting aside these risks, the point really is that this is not a decision for the state to make. It would never be permitted for the state to tell heterosexual couples, for example, that they are not allowed to have a biological child and they must adopt. The interest in having a genetic child should be protected under Section 7, regardless of the option of adopting. But doesn't, doesn't that emphasis on having a genetic child denigrate adoption? It seems to me that the court shouldn't make a pronouncement that would somehow diminish the status of adoptive parents and adoptive children. And that's what you seem to be asking, or that's what they seem to be asking for. Respectfully, Justice, we disagree. We're not measuring the ways in which one becomes a parent as of comparative value. And that does, the desire to have a biological child does not in any way mean that adoptive families are less legitimate or that the parent-child relationship is in any way less meaningful. Except that you're tying it to the dignity of the person. Both justice can attach to the dignity of the person, but when we're discussing specifically the desire to have a biological child, we believe that this is innately and on the evidence recognized as fundamentally important to certain Flavellians. For example, the fact of someone wanting to worship one religion doesn't mean that they value a different religion less. It means that they have the freedom to choose. It means that which religion you worship, just as how you have your child, can be a fundamental personal interest. That there are multiple ways to become a parent doesn't matter. The question is what is the nature of the desire to have a biological child? Well, that seems like an odd comparison to me, I'm sorry. I mean, the court has described religion as sort of encompassing, sort of you know, comprehensive claims on life affecting people's worldview. Whether I'm a parent of an adopted child or, or of a natural child really doesn't influence how I spend you know, my Sunday mornings or for that matter, my Thursday evenings. We use this comparison justice for the comparison that just as within religion there can be multiple types of religion and multiple different kinds of ways to worship, the question of how one goes about exercising that right and making that choice for oneself is not up to the state to dictate. And it doesn't denigrate the value or diminish the value of others' choices to say that to the appellants, having a biological child is of fundamental importance. Additionally, the availability of adoption affects the ability to have a child, excuse me, the availability of surrogacy services affects the ability to have a child at all. I now turn to security of the person, which can be found at paragraph 29 of our factum. In the case law, security of the person and liberty often overlap. The appellants would like to focus on the psychological harm caused by this law. The psychological effect must be serious and it must rise above ordinary stress and anxiety, but it need not rise to the level of nervous shock or psychiatric illness. As recognized by Justice Noonan in her dissent at the Court of Appeal, access to reproductive services has a profound impact on individual psychological well-being and autonomy. Section 6 sub 1 forces the appellants to accept restrictions on their procreative choice, leading to serious psychological effects. Section 6 sub 1 has itself 
imposed harms on the appellants. Harms that are additional to the distress caused their by their inability to have a child by themselves or the inherent stress of searching for a surrogate. Section 6 sub 1 is the sole reason that for the past four years, Mr. Lewiston and Mr. Soleil have been unable to pursue their best and only option for having the biological child. The state imposed harm of the denial of compensated surrogacy and consequently the serious restriction on reproductive technology are real and significant. Given that section seven is clearly engaged, I now turn to the principles of fundamental justice, which can be found beginning at paragraph 33 of our factum. The first step in this analysis is to define the object of the law. The object must be defined precisely for the purposes of section seven and confined to measures directly targeted by the impugned provision. The proper object of this law is the prevention of the financial exploitation of vulnerable women. Isn't that a bit narrow when you look at the law? It, it seems, as your friends point out, that there, there's also the, the objective of, of preventing the commodification of women's reproductive function. And that seems to me to be a very important uh, purpose of this law. We find that it is exactly as narrow as is required by the jurisprudence on this issue, and it is defined precisely to the nature of the law. Regarding our friend's submission that an additional care objective of this law is preventing the commodification of women, we find that there are multiple constitutionally fatal problems with this objective. The first problem with commodification as an objective is in figuring out what it means. There are two potential definitions. If we're defining it as the first definition, which is simply that there's money exchanged for the service, then there are two problems which render it impermissible as a legislative objective. First, this law fails because there is no distinction between the ends and the means. It effectively immunizes <coughs> the law from judicial review. On the facts, is there a distinction between uh, what <coughs> your clients are seeking to have access to and buying a baby? Yes, Justice. We resist the characterization of this as buying a baby for multiple reasons. First, because this is not a case if we're going to describe what exactly is being bought. It's not the purchase of a good like a baby or a baby characterized as a good. It's the payment for services. And uh, I'm a little bit unclear in terms of the genetic uh, material to be used. There would, uh, would both the, uh, is it gamete? Gametes. Gametes. And the, uh, uh, I guess that would, be, that would have been produced uh, without any involvement of the surrogate. In this case, that's correct, Justice. You're not dealing with her egg. You're dealing with uh, a gamete introduced into her body. Exactly. Okay. The genetic material comes from Mr. Soleil and Mr. Lewiston's sister. The surrogate, Mrs. So she's the vessel or the incubator uh, for this? The technical phrase is gestational surrogate. Okay. She has no genetic relation to the child, no biological relation at all. The labor she provides is the pregnancy and the childbirth. Have a, take a child to gestation must be one of the most fundamental human experiences one can imagine. And isn't Parliament entitled to say we're just not going to put a price on that? We're just not going to allow that to be something you can buy and sell? This, this, your question, I believe, Justice, captures fairly neatly one of the appellant, one of the respondents' points. And our response to this is that this mythology around the sanctity of pregnancy or of wo a woman's womb has no place in modern constitutional principles. Women make choices about their reproductive options and ability every single day. They choose whether to have children, how to have children, when to have children, with whom to have children. This idea is suggested by the respondents that as soon as money enters the equation, they're incapable of making this choice. We submit is, is frankly offensive. Women are perfectly capable of making this choice without being commodified or objectified or exploited. We recognize the, the normalcy and the ability of individuals to be compensated for their labor in all sorts of ways every single day. You're allowed to be compensated for physical labor, 
for intimate labor, for labor that involves your body. Reproductive labor is just this kind of labor. The second potential definition of commodification uh, <coughs> is that it targets the ill of objectification. And with that, there are different but equally fatal problems. Compensated surrogacy does not objectify women. Objectification occurs when individuals are treated as objects, meaning that their autonomy and inherent dignity is ignored or negated. When individuals choose to enter a contract and are able to negotiate the terms and compensation, that is the opposite of their agency being negated. That is the recognition of their agency. To enter into a contract freely and of your own volition is to do, to do something that is not unlawful exemplifies their agency. And in this case, we see that this is exactly what happened. Mrs. Parker is not vulnerable. She is secure in her finances, her marriage, her family, her profession, and she is secure in her ability to demand compensation for her work. So if I enter into a contract with you, I pay you $1,000, and what you have to do is punch me repeatedly in the head. Should the criminal law have anything to say about that? This sounds a lot like the latest UFC fight. <laughs> <laughs> Individuals are allowed to. <laughs> <laughs> You're apparently allowed to offer me $200 million to punch you repeatedly in the head, Justice. <laughs> And in this case, what's on offer is approximately $36,000. And we submit that this is not a coercive amount. It will not induce students to make choices. For example, if it were the exact amount of U of T tuition that they wouldn't otherwise make. <laughs> he, he knew that the tuition remark was going to come out. Somewhere. He did. <laughs> so those contracts you described, Justice, are perfectly legal. And we submit that this kind of labor should absolutely be legal. It should be recognized and it should be valued. I turn now to the, to the specifics of whether arbitrariness and overbreadth are engaged. The question under Section 7 is now whether anyone's life, liberty, or security of the person has been denied by a law that is inherently bad. To establish an overbroad arbitrary or grossly disproportionate effect on one person is sufficient to establish a breach of Section so 7. The Supreme Court has said that. Right? Correct. But we're not bound by the Supreme Court, are we? Absolutely not, Justice. I must say, speaking for myself, that, that comes as an enormous <laughs> relief. Yes, I imagine it does. And not just to him. <laughs> you are free agents. And as such, you have a unique power to use all the jurisprudence available all the policy considerations and all the arguments we put before you today to make the right decision. And we submit, as I believe is clear by now, that this correct decision will be to find for the appellants. Mrs. Parker is this one person in our case under Section 7. She's not vulnerable, she's not exploited, and insofar as the law targets exploitative relationships to try to protect vulnerable women, this is not a case here. This is not in the facts, this is not in Mrs. Parker's life, this is not in the potential contract. As I conclude, I urge this court not to lose sight of the heart of this case, which is the heart of Favellian society, the family. Mr. Soleil said it best when he explained that the family unit is the defining architecture of most people's lives. This case is about the right to create one's family free from state interference. My colleague will explain why this problem is particularly pressing for gay male couples and why this provision is not saved under Section 1. I thank this court for their questions and hand the floor over to Ms. Cross. Thank you, Ms. Lysis. Ms. Cross. Good evening, Justices. 
I will be continuing with the Section 15 and Section 1 arguments on behalf of Mr. Lewiston and Mr. Soleil. And for the purpose of both of these arguments, it's important to remember that the total prohibition on compensated surrogacy was enacted in 2004. It was enacted in response to a royal commission that issued its final report in 1993. <coughs> in the last 24 years, a lot has changed. Our social values about what constitutes a normal family, the previously unrecognized rights of LGBTQ individuals, what we know about the devaluation of women's work in the economy, and importantly, the court's equality jurisprudence. All of these things have developed significantly. With this change context in mind, my submissions today will proceed in three parts. First, Section 6.1 of the AHRA infringes the Section 15 equality rights of LGBTQ intended parents. Second, the law also infringes the equality rights of potential surrogates the very women it purports to protect. And third, these infringements, along with those under Section 7, cannot be justified <coughs> under Section 1 of the charter, charter. Here, the Attorney General has failed to show why a total prohibition on compensated surrogacy is necessary in order to achieve its objective. Now, the Attorney General has also submitted that this law constitutes an ameliorative program contained within the ambit of Section 15.2 of the Charter. And time permitting, I would like to make a few brief comments of the, on this at the end of my submissions on Section 15.1. But if we don't get to it, um, we are confident relying on our written submissions for those Section 15.2 points. I'll begin by addressing the test for Section 15.1, which was recently upheld by a unanimous Supreme Court of Canada in Kakawahistaha First Nation and Taipatak. And under this test, the appellants must show two things. First, that the law creates a distinction based on an enumerated or analogous ground of discrimination. And second, that this distinction is discriminatory in the sense that it perpetuates arbitrary disadvantage. Now, arbitrariness here means that the law is not tailored to the needs and circumstances of the group, but instead perpetuates their disadvantage. Now, it's no longer necessary for group to show that a law perpetuates prejudice or stereotypes, only that it exacerbates their disadvantage. And to this end, a group's historical disadvantage will always be essential to the Section 15 analysis. In Widler, the court noted that discrimination typically occurs where the law treats a historically disadvantaged group in a way that exacerbates their situation. We submit that's exactly what this law does. I'll turn now to applying this test to the adverse effects of this law on LGBTQ intended parents. And our submissions on this point begin at the appellant's factum at paragraph 67. So the first question, what is the distinction here? What burden does this law impose? The Attorney General agrees that section <coughs> 6.1 makes it more difficult for individuals like Mr. Lewiston and Mr. Soleil to have children. By restricting access to an essential reproductive technology, Parliament has imposed a burden on gay male couples that it does not impose on those who do not need that technology. Well, it's imposed a burden on a lot of people. Uh, they're, they're actually the smallest group, according to this, the record, the smallest group that is impacted, I think. Uh, infertile couples are the largest group, and then I think it's single males. So they're, they're actually a kind of a tail end of the story, aren't they? Well, they are disproportionately represented in those statistics, Justice. 23% of the people who access assisted human reproductive services are members of the LGBTQ community. But to get to the heart of your question, the distinction in this case cannot be framed simply <coughs> as those who require assisted human reproductive services and those who do not. And it can't be framed in this way because to do so would be to undermine Section 15's goal of substantive equality. It would be an overly formalistic line to draw and would have the effect of erasing the diverse experiences of the different groups that you mentioned under this law. And this is particularly important in adverse effects discrimination cases where we recognize that a law can have 
impacts on multiple groups. If we take the classic adverse effects discrimination case of Mayoran, which can be found at tab eight of your book of authorities, should you like to refresh your memory on it. In that case, the Supreme Court held that occupational requirements for firefighting discriminated against Ms. Mayoran on the basis of her sex. But it equally could have been found for another group that it discriminated on the basis of disability or of age, for example. Simply put, the fact that a law can have a discriminatory impact on many groups does not mean that it does not discriminate against this group. And substantive equality is meant to recognize that different groups can be affected by the same piece of legislation in different ways. For gay male couples, Section 6.1 has unique effects that are distinct from the effects on infertile couples, older couples, single men, or any other adversely affected group. And I'll turn to those discriminatory effects now. There's a double-edged sword here, isn't there? If uh, the one thing that the law does is it puts everyone on a level playing field, not everyone can afford the kind of money that your clients are going to be paying for this surrogate. And, and so if, if we follow your line of reasoning, if we adopt what you're proposing, then in fact, aren't we making it impossible for some people who might otherwise be able to secure a surrogate to secure one because they're going to go where the money is? No justice. There's no evidence on the record that suggests that allowing compensated surrogacy will wholly undermine an altruistic surrogacy market. And given that- Well, there's no market. Your, your clients looked for over two years for an altruistic surrogate. They couldn't find one. So, so you know, th to the extent that there's a market, and it doesn't sound like there's a significant one on the evidence, um, I think we can assume, can't we, that, I mean, look, there's a law in economics school around here that says that people are going to act rationally and they're going to go where the money is. And, and they're going to go to your client. They're not going to go to people who can't afford to pay them that kind of money. Justice, nowhere has the Attorney General contended that one of the goals of this legislation is to reduce economic inequality amongst intended parents. No, oh, but I have to think about it. And that could be a consideration under the Section 1 balancing effects test. But this concern seems to overlook the fact that altruistic surrogacy, so-called altruistic surrogacy, is already quite expensive. It involves IVF treatments, drawing up contracts with lawyers, potential expensive reimbursements to the surrogates themselves, up to and including reimbursements for work uh, income-related expenses. These costs can easily rise as you point out, Justice, to over $100,000. It is an expensive game. But our point under Section 15 is that none of this money currently is going to the surrogate women themselves. Instead, the concern that we might make surrogacy more expensive for some parents should not outweigh the legitimate interest that surrogate women have in being compensated for their efforts. And again, Justice, I believe this inquiry is most appropriately dealt with under Section 1 and not under Section 15, where we're considering the impacts of this law on the individual. Now, Mr. Lewiston and Mr. Soleil understand that they are already disadvantaged in society because they cannot have children without the assistance of a third party. And they agree that this disadvantage is not state-imposed. But Section 6.1 exacerbates the disadvantage by making it even more difficult for these individuals to become parents. As I noted earlier, discrimination typically occurs when the law treats a historically disadvantaged group in a way that exacerbates their situation. And the historic disadvantage of LGBTQ individuals is well established. As attested to by Mr. Soleil, gay male couples suffer from prejudices and stereotypes about their ability to parent in particular. And the most innocuous of, this of these stereotypes may simply be the assumption that gay people do not want or cannot have children. And we see this play out, for example, in the fertility guide that Mr. Lewiston was given at the clinic that is given to all service providers across Lavelle, which fails to even mention gay male couples as potential service recipients. And, but as you said at the outset, lots changed. And surely that, that bias against gay people being parents has fundamentally changed in our society, hasn't it? So is there really something there to exacerbate? Justice, this fertility guide that I'm talking mm. about uh, was given to this, the Lewistons and Soleils relatively recently. It's not 
It's not just past historic unrelated disadvantage that we're talking about here. And it's important to remember, and we often forget that in 2017, it was only just over a decade ago that gay individuals were legally and socially prohibited from forming families at all. This is not so far in our historic past that it doesn't currently affect Mr. Lewiston and Mr. Soleil's feelings of dignity and self-worth with respect to this law. And they, they suffer as well from a more sinister stereotype, LGBTQ intended parents, which is the idea that gay parents may be unnatural or illegitimate or unable to offer a stable family home. And prevalent is the idea still that gay male couples in particular will have children who grow up wanting because they do not have opposite gender parents. As Justice Laura Dubé noted in Egan and Canada, groups that are more socially vulnerable will experience the adverse effects of a legislative distinction more vividly than if the same distinction were targeted at a group which is not similarly vulnerable. For gay men, the barrier imposed by Parliament is like falling on a bruise. It has effects that are unique and distinct from the disadvantage of other adversely affected groups. With that said, I'd like to now turn to the Section 15 claim with respect to potential surrogates. Our submissions on this point begin at paragraph 77 of the appellant's factum. And the gist of our argument is this. Section 6.1 infringes the Section 15 rights of potential surrogates by prohibiting payment for a unique type of work that only women can perform. In doing so, it perpetuates their systemic economic disadvantage. But the law goes further. It also stereotypes women because it fails to account for even the possibility that a non-exploitative surrogacy arrangement could be entered into by a woman who is competent, autonomous, and reasonably wishes to be compensated for her hard work. Instead, the law paints every woman as potentially vulnerable, fragile, and weak-willed. I'd like to take a moment to clearly identify the distinction that this law creates. Under the AHRA, there are a number of third parties who are able to receive payment for the wor their work in setting up altruistic surrogacy arrangements. Lawyers, doctors, pharmaceutical companies, all of these people financially benefit off of the surrogate's provision of free labor. The one person who cannot receive compensation for her labor is the surrogate woman herself. This is the way in which the law imposes a unique burden on potential surrogates. Is it not the case, though, that when this was all being looked at, the uh, groups representing women, uh, particularly racialized women and, and impoverished women, strongly argued for this type of ban to, in order to protect the people they represent? So women's groups actually asked for this. Isn't Parliament entitled to say, we accept that and we're going, to, we're going to protect you. As you noted earlier, uh, Justice Sharp, these submissions were made to Parliament sometime between 1993 and 2004, and, and times have changed. But more importantly, legislative schemes that impose burdens or withhold benefits on a group for the group's own protection can be upheld under Section 15. They have been upheld under Section 15 but they have been where they provide some form of individualized assessment that ensures that the law's effects on the individual are not arbitrary and are not stereotyping. So an example is Eaton and Brant County Board of Education. And in that case, the Supreme Court of Canada found that a tribunal's decision to assign a child with cerebral palsy to a special education class did not discriminate against that child because the tribunal conducted an individualized assessment and determined, based on the child's best interests, um, what, would be, what would be in their best interest. Individualized assessment can ensure that the effects of a state-made distinction are properly tailored to the person's actual needs and capacities. But the individualized assessment in that case was done because that's what is required in order to make a placement decision for the child. That's a statutory requirement wasn't that the court was saying you have to do it. That was just part of the factual background. That's correct, Justice. And we're saying that if this law provided for similar individualized assessment, the court would not need to tell Parliament anything. The, the law would not 
would be appropriately tailored to the needs and capacities of the groups that, that Justice Sharp previously referenced. A similar example is but the But just to be case. clear, the court in Brandt was not saying you need that. No, yeah. you're, you're absolutely right, Justice. But we do see that I think there's a trend in the cases like AC in Manitoba, like the Winko case, like Eaton and Brandt County, where we find that a law is actually tailored to the needs and circumstances of an individual where there is some form of individualized assessment. In short, we have many of the traditional hallmarks of discrimination in this situation. Women are a historically disadvantaged group and their position of economic and social disadvantage is exacerbated by this law. The Attorney General's assertion that this law actually values women and is meant to respect their sacred position in society is troubling. Because nowhere else in society do we say that one's work is so highly valued that one cannot be paid for it at all. And that is because this law both rests on and perpetuates stereotypes about women. It relies on paternalistic views about the vulnerability or fragility or purity of women in the market for commercial surrogacy. And importantly, once upon a time, these same justifications were used as <coughs> rationales for preventing women from entering the marketplace at all. In a society that now recognizes and respects the autonomy of women, such views are in contradiction to Section 15. In the interests of time, Justices, I'd like to turn very briefly to our Section 1 submissions. And these begin at the appellant's factum at paragraph 100. As the Supreme Court noted in Carter, the Section 1 justification analysis is a process of demonstration, not intuition or automatic deference to the government's assertion of risk. And here, the Attorney General has presented only assertions of risk. It has not discharged its burden of showing that the total blanket prohibition on compensated surrogacy is demonstrably justified under Section 1. I'd like to jump straight to the minimal impairment prong of the test where I believe the real heart of the debate lies. The purpose of this law is to protect vulnerable women from financial exploitation. And as I've already suggested, a minimally impairing regime therefore must provide an avenue <coughs> for women who are not financially vulnerable and who give their informed consent to seek compensation for their surrogacy services. And in order to provide this avenue for women, Parliament can do two things. It can look to jurisdictions in the United States where Dr. Singh found that surrogates and commercial arrangements are not exploited, coerced, or commodified. And it can look to other regimes in Canada that have been adopted to deal with similar issues regarding vulnerability and bodily integrity. The most recent and relevant example would be the new assisted dying regime enacted in the wake of the Carter decision. In this regime, medical professionals are trusted to screen for all types of vulnerability and coercion, including financial vulnerability. There was a real concern in Carter that individuals who are suffering from grievous and irremediable illnesses would either be pressured or feel coerced to end their lives sooner in order to alleviate the financial burdens on their families. And here, the Attorney General has failed to show why we can screen for financial vulnerability in the context of assisted dying, but we can't do it in the context of commercial surrogacy. Instead, the assertion is simply that no permissive regime could ever achieve its objective because any regime would just accept too much risk. This line of reasoning was rejected in Carter and it should be rejected here. An approach that requires Mr. Lewiston and Mr. Soleil to demonstrate a regime that eliminates all risk effectively reverses the onus under Section 1. But it also isn't really in accordance with Parliament's objectives. Parliament itself cannot be said to be concerned with eliminating all risk inherent to surrogacy given that many of the risks the Attorney General identifies are already part and parcel of the altruistic surrogacy regime. For example, the Attorney General relies on the case of Baby M from the 1980s. And when reading that case, I would ask you to consider whether the outcome was determinative as a result of the compensation that was offered or whether it was a family law matter that resulted because 
of the genetic tie that a mother had to her child. I notice that I am coming to the end of my time, Justices, so I might just ask for a brief indulgence to conclude. Sure. Thank you. As Mr. Lewiston noted in his testimony, he and Mr. Soleil have been fighting for their family for a long time now. They were married in 2005 following the federal recognition of same-sex marriage, which was one year after the enactment of the AHRA. Since then, we as a society have made huge strides in recognizing the legitimacy of LGBTQ families. Where we have done less well is perhaps in recognizing the inherent value of the work that women in society perform to make these families and all families possible. Striking down Section 6-1 would position this court well within a social movement that increasingly seeks to recognize alternative family formation as legitimate and worthy of protection. Subject to any further questions, Justices, those are my submissions. Thank you. Thank you. Bauer? The desire of couples to pursue every available means of having a child is understandable. However, they should not be permitted to do so at the expense of the most vulnerable members of society. To paraphrase Justice Basterash in Thompson Newspaper in Canada, our values encourage us to show concern to vulnerable groups and err on the side of caution when their welfare is at stake. This is precisely the situation that calls out for deference to Parliament, who already weighed the affected interests and tailored the law accordingly. Therefore, the trial court and the Court of Appeal were correct to find Section 6 sub 1 constitutionally compliant. Today, the respondent will make three submissions as to why this court should reject the appeal. First, the provision but doesn't violate Section 7 because any infringement is in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. Second, this provision does not violate section 15 because it does not draw a discriminatory distinction. And third, in the event that the provision violates either section, the legislation is nevertheless justified under section one because it's a proportionate response. We speak to these issues in a different order than they're addressed in our faction. I will first address section seven, and my colleague will speak to section 15 and section one. The test for determining a violation of section seven has two parts. First, the claimant must show that the law deprives the, them of their life, liberty, or security of the person. And second, once that section seven has been shown to be engaged, they then must show that the deprivation is not in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. It is our submission today that commissioning parents' Section 7 rights are only engaged by the possibility of imprisonment and no further. And second, this engagement is in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. Our first submission on the engagement of Section 7 liberty interests begin at paragraph 53 of the respondent's factum. question before the court at this stage of the analysis is whether section 6 sub 1 denies commissioning parents a choice of fundamental importance. The Supreme Court has taken a narrow approach to this question, acknowledging that section 7 has the potential to be overstretched to cover all decisions. Section 6 sub 1 
is truly a prohibition on the opportunity to pay for a surrogate. It pro prohibits the way surrogacy is pursued rather than the choice itself as only the exchange of money is being prohibited. This is an economic right, and the Supreme Court has held that economic rights are generally not protected under Section 7, and therefore the liberty interest should not be in danger. Surely, surely it's unfair to characterize the interest that the, uh, that the, the, uh, the appellants present as being purely economic. It seems to me it's quite the opposite to economic. They, they, it's a very personal, emotional, deeply felt need to reproduce and to, to have, a, a, have a child. And what, what's good, what can be more fundamental than that to and anyone? Following up on that, doesn't the evidence uh, that uh, was adduced in the case present a compelling picture of the lack of availability of uh, the potential to have a child in a practical way? Yes, Justices. Our first submission, our first argument on this point is that the face of the law is speaking to an economic right. But alternatively, if this court... Well, what's the economic right? The right to pay for a surrogate. That's an economic right? I can see the right to be paid to be a surrogate is an economic right, but I don't think the right to pay is necessarily what I've always understood as an economic right. Well, Justice, I think your, your questions are going to this idea that the appellants have raised, this idea that altruistic surrogacy is so unavailable in Flavel that in essence, by prohibiting commercial surrogacy, you're denying access to surrogacy altogether, and therefore you're denying the chance for these couples to have a biological child. It's our submission that even if you accept that argument, Section 7 should not be engaged. And this is because our friends are asking the, for the recognition of a novel Section 7 interest that doesn't carry the legal significance that the case law requires. Section 7 engagement has been confined to cases of security of the person, such as Bedford and BJ. Or if the liberty interest is engaged, it's on the basis of an interference with the claimant's bodily integrity. The exception to this is BR, which our friends rely on, where a minority of the court found a protected sphere of parental decision making on the basis that parents make decisions and can appreciate the best interests of their children. But this case shouldn't be extended to cover the desire to have biological children. And that's because the appellants are not arguing on the basis of the best interests of the child. Instead, they're asking to protect the desires of the parents. It's not dispositive for Section 7 engagement that Mr. Lewiston and Mr. Soleil consider a biological child important. A choice becomes fundamental not simply because an individual holds it of importance to them, but instead that it has previously recognized legal significance, and that's lacking in this case. We would suggest to the court that in fact, the legal trend has been to move away to put less importance on biological children. So for example, the All Families Are Equal Act passed in 2016 replaced blood relationship with familial relationship in determining the best interests of, your, of the child. As your question, Justice Brown and Justice Sharp addressed to our friends, Elevating the choice of having a biological child to fundamental importance is incongruous with our respect for a variety of different family formations. <coughs> the prohibition on commercial surrogacy also does not engage security of the person. The state caused distress doesn't meet this high threshold that was set out in GJ of a serious and profound effect on a person's psychological integrity. The state isn't responsible for the initial stress of being unable to have a child because of infertility, nor is the state responsible for the inherent and ordinary anxieties that individuals experience as they attempt to overcome this infertility through avenues such as IVF, adoption, and other means. And therefore, neither of those factors are relevant in analyzing the section, the security of the person section. In Blenco, the Supreme Court made it very clear that this stress needs to be in addition to the ordinary stress that's experienced. In that case, the court held that stress and anxiety may arise from any criminal trial regardless of the process in which it occurs. And therefore, the, the court should not be concerned with all stress 
but only that which flows from the disposed delay. Although in Shauli, there was a number of judges who said that the, the anxiety, I think it was severe anxiety, that Mr. Shauli had suffered while he was on a, a waiting list was enough to engage the Section 7 interest in security of the person. Is that not comparable? Justice, the reason we suggest that's not comparable is because the onus on the appellants today was to show that by denying this one avenue of assisted reproduction, the Mr. Soleil and Mr. Lewiston experienced serious and profound psychological distress. And what we submit is that narrow margin, the, the narrow intrinsic in intrusion by the state in this case doesn't rise to the psychological distress necessary. My second submission is that any deprivation is in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. And my submission on this uh, begins at paragraph 62 of the respondent's factum. The key question before the court at this stage of the analysis is whether the law's purpose taken at its face value is connected to its effects and the individual whose section seven rights are engaged. <coughs> and therefore the first step for this court is to determine what the purpose of this legislation really is. Section 6 sub 1 has two compelling objectives. First, to prevent the exploitation of financially vulnerable women, but also to prevent the commodification of women's reproductive functions. Our friends challenge the second objective and thereby challenge the findings of the trial court and the court of appeal. However, both of these purposes find support in the legislative scheme and in previous judicial consideration. Section two of the Assisted Human Reproduction Act refers to the trade and reproductive capabilities and the exploitation of women for commercial ends as both raising ethical concerns that justify their prohibition. This purpose also has jurisprudential support. In the reference re Assisted Human Reproduction Act, Human Reproduction Act, Chief Justice McLaughlin accepted that an objective of Section 6 was to prevent commodification, as she held that the provision sought to avert the serious damage to the fabric of our society by prohibiting practices that tend to devalue human life and degrade the participant. She, she wasn't, of course, thinking of Section 7 when she said that, was she? She was, she was thinking of the division of powers argument. Is it the same? Is the characterization the same, not necessarily the same? Yes, Justice, we think that her analysis for the purposes of that case that looked at uh, the purposes of the AHRA, mm -hmm. and in this context, she was speaking about the relation between Section 12, that speaks to the reasonable reimbursement, and Section 6, and how they relate. We would suggest that it is comparable in this case. So when you're talking about the commodification of the reproductive function, you're talking about um, a woman carrying a gamete uh, and uh, allowing the gamete to grow into a baby uh, in over the nine months. Uh, and, and that is somehow given a, a different or special um, importance uh, than the many other aspects of motherhood, like looking after a child looking after a baby, being a nanny. But that, that nine month function is somehow enshrined, put in a different category. And my question is why? Yes, Justice. Your question speaks to this idea of what is the social evil of commodification that we're really speaking of, that our friends have challenged us on. I understand the, uh, you know, not being able to buy a kidney and the vulnerability that's associated with that. But what is so special about this? Justice, what's special about this is that it's a contract over someone's body and their reproductive function rather than a contract over their labor. And we submit that there is an important distinction between when you use your body in the performance of a contract versus a contract over the body itself. In this case, commissioning parents 
are purchasing control of over a woman's womb, and this is morally problematic. But in addition, these surrogacy commercial contracts are contracts over an individual's bodily, bodily autonomy. And this is problematic because women should not be passive recipients of decisions made by others, whether her body is being used to nurture another life and how it's being used when it's nurturing that life. Well, is she a passive recipient if she agrees to do it? Justice, we have two responses to that. First of all, we would submit that for many women, this isn't exactly a choice. They're in such desperate circumstances that they feel they need to enter these contracts. And my, my colleague will speak to this in greater detail. But the second submission we would make is that one of the tangible harms, one of the consequences that can come as a result of commodifying humans' bodies is that they're viewed as objects. And the way this plays out is that individuals are more likely to ask for and push for invasive terms in those contracts because they feel as if they're contracting over an object rather than an individual with needs and desires. And therefore, what we submit is that it's unacceptable for these sorts of contracts to be enforced on women that feel that they have no other choice except for the fact that they're in this financial desperate state. The next stage of the principle of fundamental justice analysis is the principle of arbitrariness. Section 6 sub 1 is not arbitrary. Unless the provision actively undermines the objective it purports to achieve, it shouldn't be found to be arbitrary. So for example, in the case of Morgenthaler, the objective was to protect women's health, but in effect, the requirements that were built into that law undermined the objective. The objective of protecting vulnerable women is analogous to the case of Carter. And in that case, the Supreme Court held that prohibiting physician-assisted suicide, quote, clearly helped achieve the objective of protecting vulnerable individuals. Removing the power of prospective parents to exploit women with financial incentives into these com commercial surrogacy contracts also clearly helps this objective of protecting vulnerable women. The lower courts were also correct to find a connection between prohibiting commercial surrogacy and preventing commodification. Any payment beyond reasonable reimbursement commodifies a woman's reproductive functions, as we've discussed, by attaching a price to those. And the prohibition of that practice is necessary to prevent that commodification. Finally, section 6 sub 1 should not be found to be overbroad. With regards to preventing commodification, as previously discussed, consideration commodifies. And since consideration is inherent to these contracts, prohibiting the practice is not overbroad. But our friends point to the present of the additional objective of protecting vulnerable women as overbroad so as to find the law unconstitutional. This argument is based on the formulation that was expressed in Bedford and Carter, where if a law is overbroad with respect to one individual, if it infringes on the Section 7 rights of just one more person, it is, should be found to be overbroad. Flavel accepts that not all surrogates are vulnerable women. However, the Bedford and Carter formulation is not appropriate in the context of a law that has multiple objectives. This is because a law with multiple objectives by nature is targeting different harms and different populations. And requiring that each of those objectives be perfectly tailored to each of those populations is an impossible standard to meet. A law that is attempting to have additional benefits by having multiple objectives should not be more likely to fail constitutional scrutiny because it has additional benefits. So does that mean that unless we accept your dual purpose argument, the, the law would fall? That if, we fi if we agree with them that the purpose of this law is, is the purpose of this law is to protect vulnerable women, you concede that Ms. Parker is not a vulnerable woman and the law, the law would fall? Yes, Justice, we concede that if it is if you only accept the exploitation yeah. of vulnerable women, it would okay. be an overbroad Thank you. law. Mm -hmm. But we do have confidence in our colleague to save it under Section 1, <laughs> nonetheless. <laughs> Post-Carter, bright line <laughs> rules have withstood uh, charter scrutiny if they met the Bedford and Carter standard for at least of one of those two objectives. So for example, 
In the Queen and AB, for instance, the Ontario Court of Appeal held that the, the legislation was not overbroad with respect to the second of two objectives, and therefore it could not be said that the effects had no connection to the mischief that was contemplated by the legislature. We suggest that similarly in this case, because the law achieves the objective of preventing commodification, it should not be said to be overbroad. I can see I'm nearing the end of my time, so I'd just like to take a brief moment to conclude. Flavel is sympathetic to the desire of couples such as Mr. Soleil and Mr. Lewiston, who wish to pursue every avenue in hopes of having a child. However, it would be morally and legally problematic to, mit, to permit them to do so at the expense of those around them. Permitting commercial surrogacy is just too high a cost. This provision does not violate Section 7, as any interference is in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. And my partner will address the issues of Section 15 and Section 1. Subject to any further questions, Thank I you. hand the, call my, the right. floor over to my colleague. Thank you, Ms. Bauer. Ms. Fan? drafting the Assisted Human Reproduction Act, it was tasked with weighing the competing interests at stake in order to arrive at a policy solution. It chose to err on the side of caution to ensure that technological innovation does not come at the expense of the most vulnerable individuals in our society. In this appeal, the respondent urges this court to use the same caution, lest the Charter, but particularly Section 15, be used to inadvertently create inequality for one group in the name of seeking equality for another. On behalf of the Attorney General of Favell, I'll argue that Section 6 sub 1 of the Assisted Human Reproduction Act does not violate Section 15, but in the event that there is any charter breach, whether of Section 7 or Section 15, it is nevertheless a justifiable one under Section 1. In support of these arguments, I'll make three points before this court today. First, the legislation is protected as an ameliorative program under Section 15.2, Second, that neither discriminates against women or LGBTQ couples under Section 15.1. And finally, that the legislation is a justifiable infringement in the event of any charter chart breach under Section 1. As the Supreme Court held in CAP at paragraph 16, Sections 15.1 and 15.2 work together to promote the vision of substantive equality that underlies Section 15 as a whole. Section 15.1 aims to prevent the state from creating legislation that actively reinforces social disadvantage, while Section 15.2 protects state legislation designed to combat it. Where these two objectives might otherwise conflict, the court's jurisprudence is clear. Remedial programs are deemed not to be discriminatory. And so for this reason, the analysis begins here. And you'll find my submissions beginning at paragraph 12, the respondent's factum. All across Flavel, women disproportionately find themselves living in precarious financial situations. These conditions of inequality leave women vulnerable to exploitation from third parties who would take advantage of their financial need to induce them into entering contracts that they wouldn't otherwise enter into they felt they had any other choice. This might be acceptable if it was the case that surrogacy arrangements were always mutually beneficial. But as we know, surrogacy can go wrong even under the best of circumstances. For this reason, Parliament acted well within its purview to prevent individuals from being coerced into contracts that might ultimately be harmful to their well-being. Now let's talk about how this fits into the Section 15.2 framework. The purpose of Section 15.2 is held by the court and cap was to protect efforts by the state to develop and adopt media <coughs> programs designed to assist disadvantaged groups. Section 6 sub 1 of the Assisted Human <coughs> Reproduction Act fulfills all three criteria for an ameliorative or remedial program. 
namely that it targets a disadvantaged group in society, it has the purpose of objecting, of, of, of ameliorating or uh, remedying their disadvantage, and that the distinction it draws serves or advances the object of the program itself. Well, the Supreme Court has said that ameliorative programs confer benefits. There's no benefit being conferred here, it seems here. There's no benefit being conferred on vulnerable women that isn't you know, conferred on other women. It's, it's more a question of you're constraining vulnerable women's behavior in a way that your friends are saying adversely affects their client in a way that implicates their constitutional rights. Justice Brown, I'd point out two things in response to your question. First, there have been a variety of number, a variety of programs that have been found to be ameliorative that don't match the traditional vision of an affirmative action program. For instance, numerous decisions of the Supreme Court of Canada have held that human rights legislation qualifies as an ameliorative purpose, but the way in which human rights legislation is ameliorative is not by conferring some positive benefit on a group, but instead by preventing other groups from actively harming them. But secondly, and to address your concerns and the concerns of my friends, as to whether or not this legislation is paternalistic towards women and constrains their behavior instead of promoting their well-being. Justice Brown, it might be the case if this, or if this legislation had a different legislative history. But as the question of Justice Sharp alluded to earlier, women's groups were instrumental in lobbying the Milne Commission to, uh, to recommend a complete prohibition on commercial surrogacy. Groups like immigrant and visible minority women of Fluvel argued strenuously that the cost and the increased risk of exploitation of women of color far outweighed the benefits that would accrue to wealthy couples. My submission on this point is simple. We've engineered a society in which some individuals are systematically placed in situations of precarious financial circumstances. Allowing people to do things like sell their organs or to sell their own children to get out of those circumstances isn't respecting their autonomy or respecting their dignity. Instead, it's taking advantage of a situation of our own making. It's beyond Parliament's ability to solve complex phenomena like income inequality or poverty overnight, but it is within its ability to solve, to prevent some of the most pernicious consequences of it. Now, having discussed some of the ameliorative objectives of this program, I think it becomes clear why the claim that the legislation instead discriminates against women under Section 15.1 should fail. And these submissions can be found at paragraph 46 of the Respondent's Factum. This legislation does not stereotype all women uh, as vulnerable to exploitation. It simply adverts to the possibility that some would, will be. But to address my friend's concern specifically about whether this legislation singles out women's work for any differential treatment, I point out that as my colleague has alluded to, Section 6 sub 1 reflects a broad understanding of the intrinsic undesirability, as Justice Bastrash put it in Harvard College of Canada, of commodifying the human body and its functions. It just so happens that we're considering this objective as applied to commercial surrogacy, which typically only women engage in. But considered in the whole context of the legislation, including other legislative schemes that prohibit similar behavior like compensated adoption, selling human organs, or selling reproductive materials, the legislation reflects a deep commitment to the inviolability of every person's body, not just women's. So I'll move on now to the main issue in Section 15.1. I guess just on that point, how does the, um, the provision of sperm for fertilization and the uh, uh, collection of eggs and all of the uh, technical work that your friends point out uh, that needs to be done and the fact that these services are being paid for, what exempts them from the uh, philosophy that you've just outlined? Why do they get paid and yet the, uh, uh, the surrogate uh, uh, is somehow uh, excluded from that opportunity. Other provisions of the Assisted Human Reproduction Reproductive Act similarly prohibit the buying and selling of human gametes, including sperm samples. Mm -hmm. Underlying the idea of the legislation as a whole is the idea that exchanging money over a transaction, over a process, uh, can degrade that process. Intrinsically valuable processes like the creation of human life, as Parliament has deemed it, shouldn't be subject to commercial transactions which would 
degrade it and turn it into a commercial transaction as opposed to a process that's intrinsically valuable. So should lawyers not get paid for drafting the contract given the subject matter? I think this question goes to the distinction that my colleague pointed out about the distinction between human labor and contracting over human labor and contracting over a person's body and a person's bodily functions. Uh, for better or for worse, society is deemed that as contracts approach go further away from a person's labor and go touch more upon their body or their body's functions, uh, the contract begins to look less like a contract over their labor and more like a body, a contract over the person itself. Well, that's what inspires my question. These are contracts, and, and, and this draws from Justice Stewart's question. Everyone here is making a buck, except for the person who has to do the work and literally and figuratively the labor. Right. <laughs> so if the philosophy that animates the preclusion of that person from gaining any money. Well, based on that philosophy, why do we not exclude everyone else from making money? Why, as a lawyer, if you're drafting a contract that deals with how a woman is going to, you know, govern her body over the next nine months, why, 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 why are the lawyers being paid for that? even if the woman is not receiving anything. Justice, I'd continue to stress that these are policy decisions made by the legislature, and what we're here to discuss is whether those policy choices are constitutionally compliant. But what's animating that policy decision that you've described? Why isn't that animating the, the, the provision of uh, legal services in respect of that same transaction? If your question is asking whether it's discriminatory That's to prevent question whether it's discriminatory to prevent some individuals from earning money in some occupations and not discriminate, and whether, uh, then we would submit that that, that that doesn't meet the test for discrimination as set out under the Charter. Firstly, the Charter require, or under Section 15.1, requires that just any distinction be made on the basis of an enumerated or analogous ground. So to the extent that there is, uh, there are differences in occupations out there, we would submit that occupation, a person's occupation is consistently being rejected as this, by the Supreme Court of Canada as constituting an analogous ground. But I do want to move on to the issue that, that I think is at the heart of this appeal, which is whether the, dis the legislation draws a discriminatory distinction against LGBTQ individuals. This appeal isn't just about commercial surrogacy. The appellant section 15, 15 arguments implicate almost every piece of legislation that regulates how people become parents, whether through adoption or assisted human reproduction. Quite simply, it's too simple of a story to say that any legislation that restricts or delays a person's ability to become a parent discriminates against LGBTQ couples just because they have more difficulty conceiving. This isn't sufficient to meet the test for a breach of section 15.1 for two reasons. First, it fails to make out a distinction on the basis of an enumerated or analogous ground. As Justice Sharp alluded to, prohibiting a marketplace and reproductive services doesn't just affect LGBTQ men. It also affects single men of any sexual orientation, infertile women, or just any woman who doesn't want to go through discomfort of pregnancy. And the record bears this out. Full 77% of individuals who turned to gestational surrogacy in Flavel were not gay male couples. And as Justice Brown's quite earlier question alluded to, permitting a marketplace doesn't necessarily benefit them. A marketplace simply means that some surrogacy services are available for a price. It doesn't guarantee a particular result to a particular individual. We don't actually know how many LGBTQ individuals who are not partners at major law firms in Flavel are in a position to pay for commercial surrogacy should it become available. And contrary to my friend's suggestion, this isn't just a consideration under section, 50, under section 1. It is relevant to a discrimination claim where the claim is that the, that the legislation creates an ad distinction on the basis of adverse effects. It is relevant, Justices, I would submit, that the legislation must actually change the material circumstances of a group, and disproportionately so. For this reason, it's not accurate to say that the legislation draws a distinction on the basis of sexual orientation and sex. Instead, as we submitted in our written submissions at paragraph 35, it distinguishes between individuals based on whether they need or desire a third party's assistance in conceiving and have the means to pay for it. 
but even if this first requirement could be made out. Discrimination requires something more than just a distinction on the basis of an enumerated or analogous grounds. Over the years, that something more has been described in a variety of forms. In law in Canada, that something more was legislation that threatened to engage human dignity. In the Queen and Cap, that something more was whether legislation results in, in a disadvantage that causes pre prejudice or stereotyping. And in Quebec and A, that something more was expressed as legislation that creates arbitrary disadvantage. But however way you cut it, the consensus in, the, in a changing world of Section 15 jurisprudence is that it's not enough to prove a distinction alone. We would submit that legislation is not discriminatory, where it takes into account a claimant's needs, capacities, and circumstances, including whether their actions engage a reasoned apprehension of harm to third parties. Now, my friends have objected that Quebec and A, and cases like Quebec and A and Tevatat, have directed courts to focus on the effects of claimants alone. But we would submit that this cannot be the test for legislation whose purpose is to regulate a discrete transaction. Focusing on the needs of just one party in the transaction doesn't tell us anything about the types of line drawing exercises that are permissible and impermissible in relationships like adoption and surrogacy that have multiple parties involved. But I will move on to our final arguments on section one, because I think that's where the crux of this appeal lies. And these submissions can begin at paragraph 81 of the respondent's factum. As the court directed in Alberta and Hatterian Brethren of Wilson Colony, a measure of leeway must be accorded to governments in determining whether limits on rights in public programs that regulate social and commercial interactions are justified under Section 1 of the Charter. Often, a particular problem, uh, a particular problem or area of activity can reasonably re be remedied or regulated in a variety of ways. <coughs> but the primary responsibility for making these difficult choices involved in public governance fall on the elected legislatures and those appointed to carry out its policies. Now because the main issue in this appeal lies in whether the legislation is minimally impairing, I'll jump to those submissions. Justice Sharp, earlier you asked a question about the difference about whether or not this legislation fails if, it, uh, if it's found to be overbroad under Section 7. So I'll briefly begin by highlighting the differences. The overbreadth inquiry asks whether a single extra person is caught in relationship to the objective of the, of the legislation. By contrast, the inquiry under the minimal impairment is whether that's catching that extra, single extra person advances the legislature's chosen objective in a reasonable manner. Here I'm going to focus on the objective of protecting vulnerable women of ex from exploitation because my partner or because my colleague has extensively addressed the issue of commodification. Now the appell appellants have relied extensively on the court's decision in Carter for the proposition that bright line rules aim to protect vulnerable populations that vulnerable populations don't withstand charter scrutiny. But there are significant differences between this case and the case in Carter. There, the claimants placed an extensive and voluminous record before the court, which allowed the trial judge to conclude that a properly administered regulatory regime is capable of protecting the vulnerable from abuse and error. And as you'll see if you turn to the, uh, to the decision at tab 12, at beginning at paragraph 102, all of the court's decisions regarding the issue of minimal impairment rely on the trial judge's findings. But here, the trial judge found that a more targeted prohibition would not have been as effective since it would suffer from enforcement difficulties and fail to adequately protect all vulnerable women. But surely if, if we're, fo I think you're saying you're focusing on protecting vulnerable women in this argument. And surely there must be other ways than totally banning, as your friend suggests. There, you could have some sort of screening uh, function, uh, you could, I, I suppose you could set amounts that, that would make it, you know, maybe minimum wage or something. I don't know. There must be other, there'd be other ways, surely, of less intrusive than a total ban if, if the only objective is protecting, that we're worried about is protecting uh, vulnerable women, wouldn't there? These other ways don't actually achieve the objective set by the government. And as the court directed in Alberta and Hitarian Brethren, the direct directive under the minimal impairment inquiry is whether or not alternative means would achieve the same objective. Right. These other alternatives, I'll address your hypotheticals in turn, a market maximum, for instance, or a market minimum, don't address the individual circumstances of the women who are most likely to be ex exploited. I would put to you that 
Uh, women, in, women who are in greater need of money require less money in order to feel coerced into entering those contracts. As to the possibility of screening, I would submit that financial vulnerability can come from a variety of sources. It's not just a function of a person's income. It can also come from the fact that they have experienced chronic job insecurity, that they have student debt, or they have medical expenses, or even that they have caregiving responsibilities for, other mem for extended mem members of their family. These factors can't be adequately captured in a single questionnaire, and a single questionnaire wouldn't capture the experiences of, of financial vulnerability across the country. We, we're, we're doing a lot of supposing here. Should we be bothered by the absence of any sort of a significant record documenting the, the, um, you know, the deleterious effects uh, on vulnerable women uh, from, you know, from commercial surrogacy? What the record demonstrates is that in the majority of countries that permit commercial surrogacy, these relationships are in fact exploitative. In the face of such a mixed record, I would direct you to the court's comments uh, in, the, in the Queen and Chalk, which is that where the uncertainty of scientific knowledge gives no guarantee as to whether an alternative scheme will achieve the same objective, the Charter does not require the Parliament to roll the dice in its effort to achieve pressing and substantial objectives in order to adopt the le absolutely least intrusive legislative provision. The standard before this court in minimal impairment uh, is whether Parliament's chosen means of achieving its objective falls within a range of reasonable alternatives. If so, the courts will not find legislation to be overbroad merely because they can conceive of an alternative that might better tailor the objective to the infringement. This was the court's direction in Albert and Hatterian Brethren. Now, since I see it nearing the end of my time, I'll just take a brief moment to conclude. Just because goods can be sold doesn't mean they should be. The marketplace is no substitute for clear moral thinking, but what it is that makes us human and what it is that is permissible to do to another human being. I'll admit, assisted human reproduction poses new moral dilemmas that have no easy answer. But democratic institutions are meant to let us all share in the responsibility for making these difficult choices. Barring any further questions, Justices, these are my submissions. Great, thank you. Any reply? No, thank you, Justice. Court will withdraw briefly to deliberate. The court's now in recess. If I could just ask you to remain where you are uh, until the judges have finished their deliberations and return. Thank you.
judgment is reserved. <laughs> Sharp is going to write. Yeah, right. <laughs> No, but we, we do have some, some things to say um, about this outstanding uh, performance that we've seen this evening, starting with Justice Stewart. All right. Um, I think that uh, all I can say is I was extremely impressed by all of you. Uh, the, uh, first of all, the facta were excellent, uh, without exception, and the arguments that were advanced were put forward so... Uh, so well every argument that was a good one was in there and uh, it what they were just a pleasure to read and uh, your uh, oral advocacy um, was uh, uh, incredibly uh, spot on i was especially <coughs> uh, taken by how well each of you were able to deal with questions, sometimes tough questions, sometimes dumb questions, uh, but uh, <laughs> I'm referring to myself, but that's fine. Uh, that's part of being uh, on your feet and, uh, and, uh, and uh, making sure that you respond to, uh, to the questions that were put to you. You, did, uh, you all did that extremely well. So excellent job, all of you. Well, I agree with that. Uh, I concur, and uh, I thought uh, I thought that I was very impressed. I, what, what I found interesting about it uh, was that you each have your own style, um, which uh, is, is even at your early stage of advocacy is interesting. And I encourage you to, to to think about having your own style. And I think what really came out of it, in terms of the people who are watching and they're probably thinking about doing a moot before too long, was. Um, preparation and to me preparation is the key to success in advocacy and you uh, all clearly knew this record extremely well there wasn't a question we could ask you uh, that would take you off your stride uh, and you had thought the case through to the extent that there weren't substantive legal questions that we could ask that you didn't at least have an answer it might not be a perfect answer but that you had your answer and so I think that was very very Impressive. So I congratulate you and uh, look forward to seeing you in the Court of Appeal, if I'm still there when you get there. Um, I want to say a word to, to um, you know, the, the parents and the friends and the supporters um, uh, about what you've just seen, because some of you may not uh, know just how, I mean, it may have looked pretty good to you. Um, I, I want to tell you just how good it was. First of all, none of you have read the factums. The factums are truly outstanding they're not they're 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 of a quality that that um, is absolutely uncommon for this stage and uh, a bit uncommon where I spend my day job too so uh, it, it, it was they were very very well put together and that was reflected in the submissions because the product of uh, the product of, of the, the thinking that went into those factums was what we saw on display here um, I also want to tell you that these uh, mooters got the real experience today. Uh, this was like appearing before an appellate court. Um, they were getting grilled in the same way and they were responding in uh, the way that we expect mature counsel to respond. The appellate saying, well, we're not trying to change the world here. The respondent saying, nothing to see here, keep driving on. <laughs> you know, these are not the droids you're looking for. And, uh, and, and, um, you know, and, and no, I'm not eating of that tree. And, and so, so they, they, it really was as good as it may have looked uh, to you. I want to congratulate also the people who designed this problem. This was a really good moot problem. I, it, it may actually be the best sort of most suitable moot problem for, for this level, for this high level of mooting. And this was a very high level moot. This is one of the very best moots that I've seen. So it's been a, a real treat. Congratulations to you all. Um, you have great careers ahead of you based on your performance here tonight. All right. Thank you, Justices, for your, your very kind words. Um, Stephanie and I would like to take a brief moment to
recognize everyone whose contributions have made uh, tonight's event possible. And each year, the Grand Moot relies on the time, the expertise, the effort that is brought by so many individuals at the law school community. So first, we want to uh, recognize uh, all of the faculty and staff whose contributions of their expert uh, advice, of their knowledge, of their time in making sure that all the, the logistics for the moot ran smoothly. We want to thank them. And secondly, uh, Stephanie and I would also like to thank uh, all the students who have also volunteered their time and effort in, in making this moot happen. And particularly our bench clerks, our four bench clerks, as well as the members of the moot court committee and all the other students who uh, sat in run-throughs and volunteered their time. And secondly, we want to thank uh, this distinguished panel for contributing their time and their wisdom and making sure that this was in fact the real deal because at law school, uh, as a student, this sort of thing doesn't happen every day. And so uh, we hope that you'll accept a small token of our Just appreciation. Brown says I'm writing this, so I'm not sure. I'm <laughs> I'd like to know which side <laughs> gave you this. Oh, it's from you. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, <laughs> Justices. <laughs> and finally, on behalf of the Grand Moot Organizing Committee, I want to express our deep gratitude to McCarthy Tatro for their long-standing support of the Grand Moot and the entire team at the firm. And now I'd like to invite Mr. Paul Morrison up to uh, say a few words. So, congratulations. So, we at McCarthy's are very, very proud to sponsor the Grand Moot. We have at McCarthy's a very long tradition of excellence <coughs> in oral advocacy. John Robinette, often described as the Dean of Canadian Lawyers, was a member of our litigation department. More recently, Ian Binney, uh, Justice Binney, was appointed to the Supreme Court of Canada uh, right out of our litigation department. So our tradition of excellence in oral advocacy is long and strong, and our belief in the importance of oral advocacy to the proper administration of justice uh, is equally strong. Uh, the courts, these judges, need excellent oral advocacy to decide cases to make the system run. Um, thank you for justifying our faith in the grand moot. You guys were fantastic. I could go on and on uh, as to how great you were, how you were great, why you were great. <laughs> I won't. I'll just focus on one thing, uh, and that is this. Um, this is a delicate uh, problem. It, 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 you know, commercial surrogacy in the context of a gay male relationship uh, is, raises tricky issues. Uh, and it would be very easy uh, for any of you, in response to the judge's questions, probing questions from experienced judges, uh, to say the wrong thing, to, to, to say the inappropriate thing. You didn't. None of you did that. You always knew how far to go without going too far. Uh, and it was very impressive. And there's only one way that that happens, as alluded to by the justices in their comments. There's only one way that happens. You knew your case. You'd thought about the case. You'd anticipated the questions, or if you hadn't anticipated the questions, you'd anticipated the issues that were raised by the questions. And again, I say there's only one way to do that, and that is to know your case. So thank you very much for justifying our faith in the Grand Moot program. You were all terrific. And you were so terrific that we have gifts for you. <laughs> now, <laughs> now a, a few years ago, a few years ago, our gifts to the Mooters came in the form uh, of, of, of a bottled substance that many barristers
uh, reach for late at night when they're finalizing their preparation to, in order to help them to keep going. Uh, and then we were told we really shouldn't be giving out that kind of gift to the, <laughs> to the mooters. So you won't find that in your little packages, but we do hope you find them helpful and welcome. Thank, I think that's in the judges. Thank you very, very much. At the uh, risk of keeping everyone longer from the wine and snacks, we also have a couple of thank yous. Um, we'd like to echo all the thank yous that have already been given to the faculty, to McCarthy's, to you justices for your preparation and very thoughtful questions. Thank you so much. We would also like to thank our friends and family and partners who have allowed us to relentlessly badger them with questions about commercial surrogacy for the last month. We're looking forward to having normal conversations with you again. Um, we'd also like to echo the thanks given to all of our professors and alumni and lawyers and judges who gave us support in the run-throughs. And then finally, and most importantly, the Mooters would really like to thank our two chief justices. Stephen Carey wrote not only a fantastic problem that was a pleasure to moot, and, and many justices have said is one of the best problems that they've ever seen written, but they also do all of the behind the scenes work as well. They schedule all of our run-throughs. They're there for all of them. They give us feedback. They coach us. It's not an understatement to say that this event could not happen without them. And so we have a couple of tokens of appreciation for them as well. They do come in a bottled form. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you all very much.